open the lights for the first time. Lights and then the, <laughs> then the mics. Yeah. I know they do. Okay. I know they do. Yeah. And, and some pictures. We have our, our youth and our elders here tonight. We'll have our youth and our elders here tonight. Exciting. So, yeah, so I was talking. President Obama. And I'll pour you some water, Wanda. Yes. And he and Michelle were going to come over for dinner this weekend. Very good. Let me see. I think I got one. Got you got it? Thank you. Do you want, do you want to guys want to come over? On you, Mo. Oh. <laughs> no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think Joe Biden's going to make it this time. Oh, gosh, that's right. Well, I'll just ask the president to come a different time. You know, you know how Barack is. Any chance he has to come over is fine. Yeah, awesome. It's great. Oh, yeah, they love Yeah, absolutely. See, we're going to do that every week, every time. We're going to do that. It's good. <laughs> <clears throat> it's Don Baxter. Hello, Don. I don't know. I haven't seen her. Was she upstairs? Well, she has that proclamation. So. She might be upstairs. I'm sure she'll be here. To stand in for her. I want you to. It's not about you. Oh. Here she comes. Oh. Oh. We're fine. We're fine. We're good. Good. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order. And I certainly want to welcome everyone here uh, on the 19th of August at 7 p.m. So glad that everyone could be with us here tonight. And uh, as our first order of business, I'm going to ask you to please join me for a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. Council Member Reese, uh, would you uh, lead us in the uh, Pledge to the Flag? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Actually, I'm not going to lead us in the Pledge tonight, Mr. Mayor. We've got the scouts from Troop 400 who are here. They'll make their way to the front of the uh, room. I'm going to ask them to lead us tonight. Great. <clears throat> Front and center, gentlemen. It's loud and proud. Let's do this. <laughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which, for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate your help tonight. Thank you very much. To our Boy Scouts, thank you, Council Member Reese. I'm also with you. And um, now we'll have the roll call, Madam Clerk. Mayor Sewell. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Council Member Alston. Here. Council Member Caballero. Here. Council Member Freeman. Present. Council Member Middleton. Here. And Council Member Reese. Here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have some very exciting uh, ceremonial items today. Uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I really, this is one of those evenings sometimes when you just have a lot of great stuff going on at the Durham City Council meetings that have nothing to do with the straight business agenda. So really glad to hear, hear to see so many people here for some of these items. The first of these items is Sierra Le Leone Day Proclamation, and I'm going to ask my colleague, Councilmember Freeman, if she would uh, do the honors tonight. <clears throat> Good 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And I'm just going to ask that the uh, Dr. Prince Heisebo and any others that are here with him come up to accept this proclamation. Might be running a little bit behind. So I'm just going to read the proclamation. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. So whereas Sierra Leone is a country in West Africa, and whereas this area was known as a place of refuge for returned slaves in the 18th and 19th century, and whereas Creole Descendants Union, North Carolina, was established in 2011 and, in it, and is a spinoff of Creole Descendants Association in the triad, and whereas Freetown became a cultural melting pot with a society comprised of four levels of indigenous inhabitants, the poor, the black poor from England, the Nova Scotians from Canada, the, Mar the Maroons from Jamaica, and the liberated Africans. Together, these make up the Creoles of, of Sierra Leone. And whereas descendants of these settlers from Sierra Leone, West Africa, have dedicated their ceremonial time to celebrate as, fam as a family reunion, as a global heritage weekend, whereby various chapters throughout the, US, throughout the USA and their global affiliates come together in peace, unity, and love to meet, celebrate and remember significant historical facts about their heritage, their symposiums, celebrations, thanksgivings, and exhibits, and to help pioneer their roles and efforts in helping to make their country Sierra Leone again. Sierra Leone gained her favorable and honorable global position. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the 20th of August as Sierra Leone Day in Durham and hereby urge all citizens to honor their contributions to Durham, North Carolina by participating in relevant ceremonies, activities, and programs. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this the 20th day of August 2018. Thank you very much, Councilmember Freeman, and we will make sure that that proclamation gets to uh, the right folks. Thank yes, you. Thank you. And now our second uh, ceremonial item, I'm going to uh, ask Councilmember Middleton to uh, do the honors and join me uh, at, the, uh, at the podium. We're going to be recognizing for the Neighborhood Spotlight Award, uh, Gina Chung. And so, uh, Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to ask if Ms. Chung and her guests would come up so we can love up on you. <laughs> it's my honor to read this. Gina Chung is the recipient of the Neighborhood Spotlight for the month of August 2018. The Neighbor Spotlight Award recognizes community members that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve the community. This month, Gina Chung, a resident of the old North Durham community, was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work she has done in her neighborhood, including, but not limited to, coordinating block parties and Sunday night dinners to build relationships between neighbors providing general support for neighbors by connecting them to resources and providing food to those in need, volunteering to support students in her neighborhood and at the Durham Nativity School. Congratulations, Ms. Chung, on being the August Neighbor Spotlight for the city of Durham, and thank you for all of the work you do to improve our Durham community. If there are any other residents that have shown up in support, please stand. All her folk, please stand up. All right. Thank you. I want to um, give my um, oh, thanks to my family, my husband, my two boys. 
um, without whom I wouldn't be able to do this good work. They show up to help me set up for parties and prepare foods and clean up the house. Um, but thank you to all my friends and family, my church family, and my friends that I've known for so long and for so short, too. Um, you support me. You encourage me. You work with me side by side. And um, just want to thank you all for that. Congratulations. Congratulations again. That's a wonderful achievement. I'm now going to uh, ask my former colleague and, and Durham's public historian, uh, Mr. Eddie Davis, if he would please come to the podium and introduce our history moment. And uh, I see he's brought a lot of people with him to help him do it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to thank you and your colleagues uh, very much for giving me another opportunity to share one of the many important nuggets of history from the 150 years since April 10th, 1869, since the, since the April 10th, 1869 incorporation of the city of Durham by the North Carolina General Assembly. The last century and a half has provided lots of opportunities to bring about equity and inclusion in so many aspects of life in our great community. Even with the progress that we've made thus far, we still have to be ever vigilant and consistently aware of equality issues. August 26th is designated as National Women's Equality Day in honor of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which spoke to the rights of women to vote. Although that right was not totally universal, uh, this amendment did make substantial progress in the ongoing quest for equal suffrage. In addition to the commemoration of Women's Equality Day, we find ourselves in the middle of discussions and debates about judicial issues on the national, state and local issues, lo local levels. Therefore, I thought this month might be a great time for the city council and our residents to look back and to spotlight two Durham women who, have, who were trailblazers, trailblazers in the area of females and the judiciary. In 1934, Mary Rebecca Mamie Dowd Walker was appointed as the first judge for the juvenile court for Durham City and Durham County. Through this appointment, according to the North Carolina, sorry, according to the dictionary, dictionary of North Carolina Biography, which is published by the University of North Carolina Press, Judge Walker became the first woman judge in the state of North Carolina. Judge Walker was a Durham native. She lived on Liberty Street. She was born in May of 1880. Therefore, she lived through and was probably involved with much of the struggle for women's suffrage. Except for one term in 1941 through 42, Judge Walker served until her retirement in 1949. Judge Walker continued to live in Durham until her death in July of 18, I'm sorry, of 1960. Uh, actually, I would like to just say one thing about that, um, that one term in which she was not reappointed. At that time, it was an appointment by the city council. Um, and it appears that she had decided to work with a multicultural team of people that included people like W.D. Hill and John Avery, names that we know of today here in Durham. Uh, but after the, the outcry that came when she was not reappointed, she was appointed again and served until she retired. Um, normally, we would have with us tonight some of her relatives, 
One of them, who is known by many of you all here, is Milo Pine. Judge Walker was Milo Pine's grandmother, um, and her Judge Walker's daughter married Milo's father, who many of us know as the renowned architect George Pine. Milo, though, is in Mexico exploring the rainforest <laughs> and other kinds of things that are associated with the work that he does. Uh, Milo also asked us to uh, ask his cousin, Meriwether Walker, to come, but she was afraid that the rainstorm that was predicted might be um, problematic for her return to, to Raleigh tonight, so she is not here. Interestingly enough, when Judge Walker retired in 1949, around that time, um, around the time when she was retiring, Karen, a child named Karen Galloway, now Karen Bethea Shields, was born in the Method community in our neighboring county of Wake. According to an article listening to history by David Silseski, uh, published in the January 12th, 2003 edition of the News and Observer, Karen Galloway Bethea Shields was one of the first black students to graduate from Broughton High School. She would let, want me to say, though, before she went to Broughton High School, she went to the renowned Barry O'Kelly High School in the Method community. She also was one of the first, uh, she went to East Carolina at a time when East Carolina also was not uh, admitting a lot of African-American students. And then she went on to become one of the early female graduates of the Duke University Law School. According to And Justice for All, a website that documents the art wall at the Durham County Courthouse, Karen Bethea Shields became the first woman elected by the voters to a judgeship in Durham County. After having been appointed to a vacancy by Governor Jim Hunt, she was later elected by the people in the fall of 1980. We're fortunate to have attorney and former judge Karen Bethea Shields with us this evening. And if you don't mind, Mr. Mayor, I'd, we'd like to ask her if she would just come up and talk a little bit about her uh, achievements and the people that she has with, us, with her. Wonderful. Please come up. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, City Councilman. And thank you, Mr. Davis. I was thinking uh, what I would say. I think I have about an hour, no, three minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take it. First, I want to let you know that I'm here because of people that prayed for me, that supported me when I was a child and all through my adult life. I got a letter about a week ago saying that next year will be my 45th class reunion from Duke Law School. And I thought about how I felt when I was waiting to hear from Judge Hunt whether or not I would be appointed as the judge. And I was scared, very afraid. And my grandmother looked at me and she said, I'm going to sing a song to you. I don't feel no ways tired. And that became my theme song. And I realized over all these years, I don't feel no ways tired because of the support that I've had, the love I've had. I have been blessed all of my life. And that's why I wanted to serve as an attorney to represent black people and poor people. And I am still passionate about the law, even though I've been practicing for a long time. As a judge, I love being on the bench, helping people, trying to be fair. Tonight, I am proud to have not only my legal family, Judge Harden, Judge O'Neill, now Dean O'Neill, my church family, Pastor Newkirk, Mrs. Newkirk, and also my other pastors, friends from New Hope Missionary Baptist Church. My church is Oak City Baptist. I have lawyers in the audience. I have church members. Would you all please just stand? <laughs> the 
this is the reason why I have made it this far. My Aunt Kat, who's standing right there, the pretty lady right in the front. My nieces, somewhere around here, right behind me, figures. All of my friends who have prayed for me and still pray for me. I don't get tired. I still want to keep on serving whatever I do. Thank you, and I feel humble in glory to God for all this honor. In conclusion, uh, that's Judge Mimi Dowd Walker and Judge Karen Galloway Bethea Shields helped to carry the quest for justice, equality, and inclusiveness for Durham, for North Carolina, and for the United States of America. Thank you, Mayor Shule, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, other council members, and staff members for the opportunity to salute these judicial pioneers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Public Historian, we appreciate one more fabulous history moment. Thank you so much. Judge Shields, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. We're not going to try to keep you all here. We know you probably have other things to do than to hear our business. So you're not going to hurt our feelings if you decide to leave. <laughs> We're so glad you were here. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And now we have uh, our last ceremonial item, uh, the, the Durham Youth Commission induction. <laughs> Y'all gonna join me? Okay. All right. So tonight we are going to induct the new members of Durham Youth Commission. The Durham Youth Commission is an absolutely wonderful organization that I'm going to tell you all a little bit about tonight. Um, and uh, we're then going to welcome the new members of the Youth Commission and, uh, and, and swear them in. Are they going to be sworn in? Okay, great, fantastic. Um, authentic youth engagement requires that young people have actual authority and responsibility as well as opportunities to develop the skills necessary to make sound decisions. When youth are engaged and share power in the city's decision-making processes, everyone benefits. Youth gain invaluable decision-making skills and a sense of community, belonging, and purpose. The community benefits from the expertise and lived experiences of young people growing up in our changing world. The Durham Youth Commission strives to be an example of authentic youth engagement in Durham. The DYC was created in 2005 to actively involve young people in policies affecting them, broaden the scope of youth leadership in Durham's affairs, and develop good civic leadership. This year, we have 25 DYC members, 13 returning and 12 new, representing nine schools across Durham. The DYC is one of many youth steering committees and advisory boards across the city that are creating opportunities for youth engagement and fostering the core values that we uphold here in Durham. Values such as civic engagement, integrity, community, teamwork, leadership, open communications, and fairness. The Durham Youth Commission will also be working hand in hand with the Office on Youth's new City County Strategic Initiative to develop a strategy to authentically engage youth in local government, create a network of youth committees and boards, and help facilitate coordination between, between Durham's youth-serving programs and services. It is crucial that we recognize that youth are not the leaders of tomorrow, but instead the leaders of today. 
Young people have the power to impact and influence the world around us. They can be the catalyst driving change in our schools, communities, state, and country. This is why it is imperative that we support young people in Durham and use our power to amplify their voices and opinions. So at this time, I'd like to, uh, oh, actually, Elise, I think you're going to do the introduction. Is that right? We changed the program. I'm going to invite Elise up to do the introduction. Come on up, Elise. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, Council. My name is Elise Frazier, and I am the advisor for the Dorm Youth Commission. I'm also the youth initiative analyst in the city, uh, in the office on youth for the city of Durham. I have the pleasure of ton uh, tonight um, to introduce and welcome up here an amazing young woman, Jenny Uba, who's also a senior at City Medicine Academy this year. Jenny is going to come before us and tell us about her experience in the DYC. Can I just have a round of applause to welcome Jenny in? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Jenny Uba, and this is my third term on the Durham Youth Commission. The Durham Youth Commission is by far one of the best organizations I've been a part of. Being on the Durham Youth Commission has enabled me to meet new people, be active in the community, form connections, and be a well-rounded person. Without joining the organization, I would not have been, I would not have been volunteering and been involved in, community, in the community as much as I do now. The Durham Youth Commission allows the youth in Durham to have a formal role in the city's decision-making process. The organization serves as a bridge between the youth and the local government in Durham. As members, we attend conferences around the state to collaborate and learn from other youth councils and participate in various, various service learning initiatives. Serving on the DYC allows members to take initiative in strengthening their leadership and collaboration skills while undertaking projects and presentations such as this scrapbook or advocacy projects we complete each and every year. DYC also enabled me to network, build connections, have a strong work ethic, problem solve, and which are all good qualities to have and skills to acquire. My membership has allowed me to complete over 80 hours of community service throughout my terms, all while enjoy enjoying myself and having fun. Waking up on Saturday mornings to assist with bagging groceries at Mobile Market or attending parents' night out on Friday nights to spend time with kids who live with disabilities makes me feel like I have done at least something productive within my day. I always find volunteering to be fun, productive, rewarding, and worthwhile, and I'm glad I get to experience that on serving on each term. For my final term on the DYC as a senior, I am looking forward to working on new projects and expanding my knowledge while working with all members in which I consider my DYC family. For the new term, the DYC is shifting our focus from mostly serving service learning to youth advocacy and engagement. And I'm really excited for the new term and I can't wait to work with, to work with and get to know all the new members. I hope they will enjoy this new experience on the DYC and find their involvement in the organization to be productive and fulfilling as I did mine. I am hopeful and eager in making this term on the DYC another great one, like the ones prior. Thank you. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge DYC members who, who would not join us tonight. Ray Palmer, Riverside High School, 12th grade, fourth term on the DYC. Larianne Whitehall, City of Medicine Academy, 12th grade, second term. Blake Armstrong, Dean, Hillside New Tech, 11th grade, first term on the DYC. Anaga John Dayen, Durham School of the Arts, 11th grade, first term on the DYC. Now, if all the members of the DYC join me in front, in the front, and everyone can join me in a round of applause to welcome them. Um, my name is Jake Terry Edmonds. I'm an 11th grader at Durham School of the Arts, and this is my first term in the Durham Youth Commission. My name is Holly Taylor. Uh, I go to Doran High School. I'm in grade ninth, and this is my first term in Durham Youth Commission. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jessica Uba. I'm a senior at City of Medicine Academy, and this is my third term in the Durham Youth Commission. Uh, my name is Henry Cruz Reyes. I'm a junior at City of Medicine Academy, and this is my first term in the Durham Youth Commission. 
Uh, my name is John Pacillo. I'm a senior at Jordan High School, and this is my third term on the Durham Youth Commission. Uh, my name is Miles Leathers. I'm a rising senior at Hillside High School, and this is my third term on the Durham Youth Commission. Uh, my name is Tino Mavera. Uh, I'm a junior at Trinity School of Durham and Chapel Hill, and this is my first term at the DYC. Hi, my name is Rita Cabicho. I'm a senior at City of Medicine Academy, and this is my third term in the DYC. Hi, I'm Rebecca Sosby. I'm in ninth grade at Durham School of the Arts, and this is my first term on the Durham Youth Commission. Good evening, my name is Lama Kachab. Um, I go to Voyager Academy, and this is my second year on the Durham Youth Commission. Hi, my name is Wendy McIver. I go to Jordan, and I'm a junior, and this is my first year on the Durham Youth Commission. Good evening, my name is Azaria. I'm a sophomore at Jordan High School, and this is my first term at DOIC. Hi, I'm Emiat Conspiracy. I'm a sophomore at Jordan, um, and this will be my second year on the DYC. My name is Wagun Mansoor. I'm a senior at City of Medicine Academy, and this is my third year under Durham Youth Commission. Hi, my name is Melissa Mavura. I'm a junior at Trinity School of Durham in Chapel Hill, and this is my first term at the DYC. Good evening. My name is Sarah Patterson, and I'm a senior at Durham School of the Arts, and this is my third term on the Durham Youth Commission. Hi, my name is Buddy Bomsey. Uh, I'm a senior at the North Carolina School of Science and Math, and this is my third term on the DYC. Hi, my name is Kaylin Brevet. Uh, I'm a junior at Jordan High School, and this is my first term in the DYC. Hi, my name is Emma Terry Edmonds. I'm a rising junior at Jordan High School, and this will be my first term on the DYC. <laughs> Or just stay up. Just a selfie, or is this going to be a real photographer? <laughs> you want to stand here or up there? Yeah, you can, you can come down. And okay. They're all going to be taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. You got to tell us what to do. Yeah, Please come down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> And as a last little piece of that ceremonial item, I'm going to ask the parents and families of those young people who are here, if you wouldn't mind standing, family members who are here. That's awesome. All right. Thank you very much. You're most welcome to stay, but you know you have homework. No, you don't have homework yet, do you? <laughs> well, you have parties to go to, so please go out and enjoy yourself. Uh, really great, uh, wonderful night of ceremonial items, and thanks to all uh, for participating. And now I'm going to ask council members any announcements by members of the council. Any announcements? All right, uh, prior. Priority items. I'm going to, uh, Ms. Deputy City Manager, any prior, priority items? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Item 18 on the consent agenda was up, updated on your uh, agenda about five this afternoon. Uh, the City Attorney has a brief summary of what those uh, updates entail. Uh, so that would be my announcement this evening. All right, thank you very much. 
Uh, I don't believe we need to take a vote on that. Um, Mr. Attorney, any uh, priority items? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, I have uh, included in, in uh, agenda item number 18 uh, an edited memo and then the clean version and also an edited interlocal agreement and a clean version as well. Uh, the edits are, are fairly straightforward, but of course I wrote them, so I, I think they're all uh, straightforward. Um, but if you have questions, this is on uh, consent. Um, I'm happy to, to take those questions right. if you'd like. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Attorney. Madam Clerk. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I do have an agenda item. I would like to invite Shalia Arias Abonza forward, please. Ms. Arias Abonza is a member of our Participatory Budgeting Steering Committee, and, and I would like to administer her oath of office. Please raise your right hand. Put your left hand on the Bible. Would you like to um, swear or affirm? Swear. I'll probably just repeat your name as I say state your name. I state your name. Sheila Arias. Sheila Arias. Do hereby solemnly swear. Yes. Repeat after me. Here by Father and Swear. That I will support and maintain. That I will support and maintain. The Constitution and laws of the United States. The Constitution and laws of the United States. And the Constitution and laws of North Carolina. And the Constitution and law of North Carolina. Not inconsistent therewith. Not inconsistent therewith. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of my office. Discharge the duties of my office. As a member of. As a member of. The participatory budgeting. Participatory budgeting. Steering committee. Steering committee. So help me God. So help me God. I have read. I have read. Understand. Understand. And subscribe to. And subscribe to. The code of ethics. For the city of Durham. The Code of Ethics for the city of Durham. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. We're so glad to have you as a member of our Participatory Budgeting Steering Committee. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, and <laughs> now we're going to move to our consent agenda. The consent agenda uh, can be approved by a single vote of the council. Uh, items can be removed from the consent agenda by members of the council or by any member of the public. And if removed, will be considered uh, at, the, at the end of our meeting tonight. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull item 18. Yeah, we'll get there. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes. So uh, I do not have item 18, even though I've referred to it. Yeah, so if you, th that item came in late, and so um, if you haven't, if, if you hadn't updated your agenda, you may need, uh, there is an email uh, that was sent to our DurhamNC.gov uh, email as well that has the, uh, that has the item also, that has the changes to the memo. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let me just look at these folks who have signed up here before I, Okay. For the consent agenda, item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, Carolina Theater of Durham Board of Trustees appointment. Item four, Recreation Advisory Commission appointments. Item five, Raleigh Durham Airport Authority Federal Aviation Administration FAA grant offer FAA AIP grant number 3-37-0056-050-2018. Item eight, proposed acquisition of the Durham Beltline property. Item nine, proposed lease for Dur police district number two substation at 5285 North Roxborough Road. Item 10, building inspections online payment functionality module. Item 12, this item can be found on the general business agenda. Item 13 to 15, these items can found on the, be found on the general business agenda public hearings. Item 18, contract with the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau for implementation of the city's 150th anniversary celebration in 2019. And that item has been pulled for consideration at the end of the meeting. Um, and those are the consent uh, items. Can I hear a motion on the consent, items, consent so items with the exception of item 18? So moved. Second. Second. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The consent agenda passes 7-0. Thank you very much. 
All right, uh, we will now move on to our general business agenda. Uh, item 12 is the 2018 second quarter crime report presentation. Uh, we do have one speaker on that, Mr. Chris Tiffany, uh, but we will hear the report first, then we will hear Mr. Tiffany's comments, and then we will have questions and comments by the council. Welcome, Chief. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Brings me pleasure this evening to present to you the Durham Police Department's second quarter report for 2018. This report will cover our part one violent crimes, our part one property crime, part one index crime, clearance rates, response times to priority one calls, and staffing levels. In addition, I will respond to some very specific inquiries made by some of my council members and briefly discuss some of the 2018 second quarter highlights covered in more detail in the companion document that, both, that, that most of you have received already. So we'll start with part one index crime, January to June 2018. This slide illustrates reported part one index crime which is a total of part one violent crime and property crime. Part one index crime decreased by 13.5% during the first six months of 2018 compared to the same period in 2017. Reported crime was down in six out of seven crime categories as well for overall part one violent crime and property crimes. Homicide was the only crime that showed an increase. Property crime made up 84% of all reported part one crime. One category, larcenies, comprised more than half, 57% of all part one crime. There were double digit percentage decreases in reported rapes, robberies, aggravated assaults, larcenies, and motor vehicle thefts. These decreases are attributable to a variety of factors, uh, a renewed focus on uniform patrol staffing, um, successful apprehension of key repeat offenders um, that had been on our radar, uh, much coordination in the Durham DA's <clears throat> office with the investigators and our robbery task force, particularly in the case review process, increased involvement in community support, which we've seen in, in many of our communities to provide information and intelligence in order for us to be successful in these cases and continue hard work on the investigators um, to try to get timely resolve in some of these instances. Next slide here is part one violent crime. Part one violent crime includes homicide, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. Part one violent crime was down significantly by 28% during the second quarter due to double digit decreases in robberies and aggravated assaults. Our focus for the last several months has been the reduction of robberies and aggravated assaults throughout the city, particularly in some hotspot areas. Chief. Yes, sir. I usually don't interrupt you, but I just want to for one minute. Yes. Because I want everybody in this room and everybody who's watching this at home to wrap their mind just for a minute around that 28% figure. That is a tremendous achievement. And we know we can't do that every quarter or every half, but to have violent crime down 28% for the first half is over last year is a remarkable achievement. And uh, I've usually I don't cite the, you know, because the, there's so much variability quarter to quarter in these statistics and they go up a few percentage, they go down a few percentage, and, and, and I, I usually think it doesn't matter much, but that is a big number. And I just want to congratulate you. I want to congratulate your other chiefs that you have here today and the entire department for this achievement. Thank you, Mayor Shul. Um, well, well noted. Um, sometimes you hit a sweet spot and we, we tried several different um, 
activities and operations to try to see what we could do with what we had in order to reduce some of the um, violent crime that we were seeing in the city. We have had some good uh, weeks over the last six months and we're working to continue that. And um, I appreciate that and so does my team here. Uh, a lot of work and a lot of work from the officers who are remaining vigilant and visible, which has been very helpful. Thank you. There we go. So this chart really sort of illustrates a little bit more about the first six months of the year. Um, it's a weekly comparison of reported violent crime during 2018 compared to the same week in 2017. And you can see the ebb and flow of where we had spikes from certain weeks and of course um, around uh, our summer months, as we start getting into the summer months, it's, it's not unusual for us to see a bit of a spike, but we were still in um, the negatives as it relates to our uh, reductions. The number of reported violent crimes were the same or lower as weeks in 2017 or in all but seven weeks during the first six months of 2018. There were 14 homicides during the first six months of 2018 compared to 10 in the same period of 2017. Five of the 14 cases remain open at this time. The number of reported sexual assaults dropped by 11%. Six of the reports represented sexual assaults that occurred in prior years. Robberies dropped significantly during the second quarter of 2018 to the lowest second quarter number since 2012. Investigators arrested several people who were each charged with committing multiple robberies throughout the city. The number of aggravated assault victims dropped by 25%. That was huge for us too, as aggravated assaults were uh, also uh, a thorn in our side for, for several weeks. We count aggravated assaults incidents by the number of victims, as you know, and the number of actual incidents dropped by 22%. The number of victims in multi-victim firearm incidents decreased by 36%. 34% of all aggravated assaults during the first six months of 2018 were from multi-victim firearm incidents versus 39% during the first six months of 2017. Our target is to reach a 30%. Um, these are the lowest percentages since 2013. So overall, part one, property crime was down by 10%. This was a 10-year low for the first six months of the year. Burglaries were also at a 10-year low for the first six months of the year. Property crime makes up 84% of all part one crime. This is a similar chart reflecting property Crimes. This chart similarly depicts the ebb and flow also of the property crime on a weekly basis for the first six months of 2018 compared to property crime during the same weeks in 2017. And as you can see, come June, we get those little spikes in our crime reports. Property crime was down during 18 of the first 26 weeks of 2018. This chart breaks down part one property crime by numbers of incidents. Overall, part one property crime was at a 10-year low for the first six months. Larcenies comprised more than half, 57% of all part one crime. 45% of all reported larcenies were from motor vehicles or involved thefts of auto parts and accessories. More than 25% of all larcenies involved shoplifting. We noticed an uptick in the number of larcenies from motor vehicles, particularly from unlocked vehicles with valuables in plain sight. We continue to utilize media sources to inform our community members about these reoccurring trends 
and offer crime prevention tips via social media and a number <coughs> of other means in order to try to suppress this type of crime. Of course, again, the Honda Accord <laughs> continues to lead in the most sought after vehicle to be stolen, which has been a constant target for the past seven years. So all you Honda Accord <laughs> owners, <laughs> lock them up. Pardon the pun. <laughs> the, the mayor pro tem, did you, did you hear that? <laughs> oh, I hear it. Every, every quarter I every hear quarter. it. <laughs> I lock it up good. <laughs> so um, to our clearance rates, we compare our department's clearance rates to other departments our size through FBI statistics. In 2017, our population grew. So we are now in a higher category of population. As shown, our clearance rates were better than the average for cities our size in all categories during the first six months of 2018. I've highlighted some of those, which for me is huge to get these types of clearance rates. The homicide clearance rate is at 100% because there are several cases from 2017 um, that were cleared in 2018. Um, we Tribute some of this to, like I said before, better coordination, a laser focus uh, approach from our investigators on, on individuals and bands of individuals who are committing certain crimes in our areas. These individuals are often involved in other activities like aggravated assaults and gang activity as well. So our priority one calls for service there were 4,420 prior to one calls for service in the first six months of 2018, which was a 5% decrease from 4,634 priority one calls during the same period in 2017. Our average response time was 6.1 minutes, which was below the target of our 5.8 minutes. We answered 51.3% of priority one calls in less than five minutes in the first six months of 2018, which um, did not meet our 57%, but was in a better place than it was in the previous quarters. Um, I'm also, I'd also like to respond to um, Council Member Alston, who made an inquiry in reference to our priority one calls and the fact that we can, we constantly stay at this six minute spot um, what I did is a little bit of history to see how we got to the 5.82. And in, in doing a little bit of digging, I found that between 2001 and 2004, the goal for the Durham Police Department was set at 6.5 minutes. And in 2004 to 2006, the goal was set at 6.1. 2006 to 2007, the goal was set at 6.3. 2007, to 2011, the goal was set at 6.5. So in 2012, with an increased population and urban sprawl in the city, we went to 5.8. We're still holding it down at six, which is some seconds off that 5.8, but um, it, 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 it makes you consider the fact that you know, the calls for service, the goal has gone down and we're still managing to hold on to at least six over the last, um, actually the last couple of years since I've been here it sort of goes from right at 6.0 to 6.3 from time to time. So we will continue to evaluate that as we increase our staff and I'll talk a little bit more about staffing too. Um, don't want to change the 5.8 because I'm saying I'm not saying that it's not doable, but it does give you some context about where we came from and where we are now. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our sworn staffing uh, was at 91 percent at the end of 2000, the June 2018 uh, quarter. Uh, today, it is now at 98 percent. Our non-sworn staffing was at 87% at the end of June 2018. It is now at 88%.
19 recruits uh, from Basic Law Enforcement Training Academy number 47 graduated recently on August 9th, and thank you for those who were in attendance. 33 new recruits started in BLET number 48 on August 13th, so we graduated a class and immediately started a class. This academy is scheduled to graduate in February. Class mm -hmm. number 47 and 48 represent the department's efforts to achieve diversity in its ranks, seating a mix of Caucasian, Black, Hispanic, Asian, and female recruits. We also have three officers in the Advanced Law Enforcement Training ALET program right now. This is an accelerated program for officers who are already certified in the state of North Carolina. So in an effort to assist in the investigation and successful prosecution of certain crimes, the Durham Police Department reviews applications in the U-9 Immigration Status Program. This program, known as U-Visas, is an immigration benefit for victims of certain types of crimes who are currently or have previously assisted law enforcement or who are likely to be helpful in the investigation or prosecution of reported criminal activity. By reviewing the certifying applications, the department seeks to secure the assistance and testimony of crime victims who may otherwise become unavailable due to their immigration status. On January 15, 2018, the Durham Police Department updated its U visa policy for certifications. Historically, most cases were denied due to the lack of workable leads. The new policy allows for qualifying cases less than four years old to be certified even if the case is inactive. We still look for those workable leads, however. Under this new policy modification, more requests for U visa certifications are being received and more are being approved. Today, the Durham Police Department is taking a more proactive role in helping crime victims take advantage of this program when eligible. Using Spanish language radio interviews and social media platforms to communicate policy changes. For the first and second quarter 2018, there is a 50% increase in requests and a 67% 67, 67 approval rate compared to 21% approval in 2017. <clears throat> Due to the increased number of cases reviewed in recent months, the department will reevaluate the program in 2019 to consider extending the time window beyond the four year period. And um, at this time, I think this might be an appropriate time to maybe respond uh, to an inquiry by um, Councilmember Caballero. Um, the reason for someone who might be declined, it could be different reasons um, besides the four-year window. Uh, it could be that the person or the individual on the report was not actually the victim of the crime. We get some of those. Sometimes we get cases where the individual actually closed the case several years ago themselves and the case is late, dormant, without any leads or any type of activity because of that individual's request. Um, we've had uh, some of those. And as I uh, mentioned before, uh, of course, I have Captain Vaughn here. She doesn't necessarily need to come up, but if there are some additional questions or if you think we need to have more discussion, I'd be glad to do that. Yeah, I do have some additional questions, but I'll, I'll let you proceed and then we can come to it. At okay. The end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our community engagement um, unit, the community engagement unit, which was formed earlier this year of the 10 officers that are assigned to the McDougal Terrace community, and now also Cornwallis um, of the Durham Housing Authority have been very active. They have also um, been involved in attending meetings in the Durham Housing Authority communities as needed in recent months Part one, violent crime, homicide, rape, robbery, and aggravated assaults in McDougal Terrace dropped by 62.5%. On June 2nd, the Durham Police Department held a community cleanup uh, in that particular community in an effort to bring community members together and to try to improve the environment 
in which some of our um, citizens lived. It was well attended. Um, we had um, individuals from Keep Durham Beautiful, Fidelity Investments, of course, the Durham Police Department, um, our AKA sorority, local um, sorority, and the Durham Housing Authority, um, to include parks and recreation, were on hand to help pick up trash. Residents of Medugal Terrace participated as well in the cleanup, and in all, more than 1,200 pounds of trash was collected that day. And of course, um, in your written document, there are several highlights about different community activities, a bingo night that was held, um, trips that our officers are involved with, with some of the young people in that community to try to establish a different kind of relationship between the police officers assigned there and the community members and, and our young people. Um, they also um, have gone over to uh, North Carolina Central University. Some of the young people that live in McDougal Terrace had never set foot on the campus of North Carolina Central University before and were able to meet the football team over there with some of our officers. They have been in swimming programs during the summer, have partnered with parks and recreation and various types of sports activities. And 100 children were taken to the Durham Bulls game by Durham police officers, um, not just in McDougal Terrace and also the Cornwallis communities. DPT staff uh, met with DHA employees to discuss turning an old water park that's out there in McDougal Terrace into an outdoor theater. This has been some ongoing communication to find other things for our young people to do. So they've been working on um, cleaning up debris from the area, trimming back vegetation and power washing uh, the area. And now they are working with the department, um, the housing department to identify funds to erect a theater in that area. So, <clears throat> these are just a few highlights, um, and some of you are already familiar with um, Officer Rousey, who assisted and was kind and compassionate in her assistance with a motor vehicle, uh, a motorist who was sort of stranded, and her loved ones were looking for her, and Officer Rousey took it upon herself to make sure that this woman was taken off of the freeway. She was stranded on I-40 and was just sort of lost in her, you know, place and uh, was able to make sure that she got to her, her family members. Um, Officer Goss and Officer Rogers also um, assisted an elderly veteran and cooked breakfast for this gentleman who was also somebody that was sort of lost in their way and needed to eat and uh, they actually cooked a breakfast meal for this gentleman, and um, it was duly noted and appreciated that they, did, they didn't have to go out of their way to do that, but they did. I like that the report actually listed what they made for breakfast. It sounded very good. <laughs> when I saw that, I said, that does sound pretty good. <laughs> and then the last but not least, of course there are others, but these just sort of stood out. That Investigator Gardino was assigned a call about a woman who was mo whose motorized wheelchair was stolen from outside her apartment where she had to keep it because she couldn't lift it to bring it inside the apartment. Investigator Gardino purchased items and built this woman a ramp on his day off so she could get her wheelchair into the apartment. In addition, he ended up donating a, a vehicle, a, a, not a vehicle, but a wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair for this um, person. This motorized wheelchair was one that was owned by one of his relatives and he donated it to this woman so that she could be mobile and get around. And last but not least, um, our new headquarters is um, in its final stages right now. The um, building is on East Main Street and it's on its track to be completed by the end of 2018. New headquarters will house the current headquarters staff in Durham Emergency Communications as well as Central District 5 and Forensics. 
public open house and festivities um, is scheduled for October the 20th. Uh, I also have a response that I want to um, provide an additional response, Council Member Alston, um, on the speed enforcement operations um, and how are speed enforcement locations selected. So large-scale speed enforcement operations have been held monthly in an attempt to reduce the number of serious and fatal crashes in Durham. Last year, the number of fatal crashes was at a five-year high in the city, and we're currently ahead of that number this year. The locations are chosen by um, the North Carolina Department of Transportation's top 10 accident locations reports and also complaints from citizens who um, will sometimes call me directly, sometimes call other city officials or call the actual district to, to um, complain about traffic issues. And um, that's how we sort of identify the various uh, locations. Uh, we are also somewhat limited in choosing locations because of the number of officers that have to be situated in order to run these types of operations. So it has to be an area that's safe and logistically feasible in order to set it up. But it is driven by data and not just on a whim, so to speak. And another inquiry into the juvenile arrests. So there were 206 juvenile arrests. And out of those 206, your inquiry was really about how many were from the school system. Uh, after taking a deeper dive into the 206, there were nine that actually came out of the school system. Not um, too many, not so significant that it, it it's, looks like a problem or anything, but the age range was, was from 12 to 16 years old. Uh, one was a weapons violation, simple assault. Two were burglary. One was a vandalism. Um, two were lar two larceny charges, a stolen property charge. And that just kind of gives you an idea of what those different charges were. And I think that was it for your inquiry. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay. And... Um, I did want to mention as well while I'm here that citizen complaints are down. They're actually down 80%, which is huge. The actual numbers of citizen complaints from 2018 and 2017 went from five, uh, 25 complaints this time, 2017 to five um, this time, this year. Our administrative investigations, those investigations that we actually initiate are up about 75%, which means that we're doing a little bit of uh, investigating internally more on various types of infractions. So uh, I wanted to share that with you as well. Um, and as I said, most of these investigations, investigations were initiated by the Durham Police Department and I think that might conclude my report. Thank you. Chief, thank you for a great report. Uh, I'm going to, <coughs> council members, before I, <coughs> excuse me, before I ask for your questions and comments, we do have one speaker on the item, Mr. Chris Tiffany. Mr. Tiffany, um, if you would come to the podium, uh, and you have three minutes, and then we'll... Uh, Get the chief back up for questions and comments. Thank you, chief. How to lie with statistics. It's got cartoons and examples of some of the ways PR experts lie, deny, and hide from reality. Official reports are PR documents. They are, and they are PR experts, skilled in public relations, media relations, and government relations management. Think critically about official statistics. What's missing? What are they not telling us? For example, Complaints and crimes reported by the police are not the same as crimes and co complaints reported to the police. You can make a complaint, but that doesn't mean that they'll file your complaint. It's practically impossible to see what they fail to document, like ticket fixing or misconduct complaints may just go away. And in bureaucracies, if it's undocumented, it's invisible, as if it never happened. 
when you hear the word undocumented, think undocumented crimes and undocumented use of force by the police force. They told counsel that they do not document pedestrian stops, searches, or even use of force against pedestrians unless they suffer reportable injuries, and they don't report pedestrian searches unless they report taking contraband. Search and seizure of contraband for pleasure or profit is armed robbery. And I've seen cops commit armed robberies. But don't complain. Seeking ordinary criminals on complainants is just one of many ways they can make complaints and complainants disappear. Indy Week reported the cops uh, threatened complainants, witnesses, and even family members of complainants and witnesses. And after she was brought in to replace Chief Lopez, singled out by WNCN Investigates for not documenting police force use of force, Chief Davis said in response to a policy complaint about use of force not being documented by the police force, he said civilians should report use of force to the review board, amateurs, but they don't take complaints. And after her last quarterly report, when I, re when I complained and tried to tell her about efforts to stop public strip searching, she cut me off and said, surrounded by her command staff, I don't want to hear about it, and turned her back and walked away again. Her staff, from the front desk all the way up the chain of command, knows she does not want to hear about embarrassing complaints. The department does more to deter complaints than to deter misconduct. I've handled about a 1,000 complaints, mostly inherited from predecessors, but we had professionals to take, document, and file complaints, forward the complaints to operations, me, to investigate and take corrective action, including revising operations policies and procedures. Term one call professionals could do the same thing here, but not unless you let them do their jobs and treat complainants, complaints about the police department the same way they're supposed to treat complaints about any other department. Receive, document, and file complaints with tracking numbers and require a response within two weeks. Not, say, two years later, we'll take a look at it. Fix the complaint system. Fix that and other policy failures. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Tiffany. All right. Uh, your reports, your, your remarks are duly noted, sir. Thank you. Uh, council members, uh, I know we have some questions and comments. Council Member Caballero, I know you have some things to ask about the UVs. Would you like to ask those questions? Yeah. Um, thank you for answering my questions earlier. I really appreciate it. I also appreciate you sending the extra documents. Um, that was helpful. And so I just wanted to note that, and so I have a few questions. So some of it is around quarter one and then quarter two. Uh, reviewing those documents that you sent to me, it seemed that there was 13 in the first, qu first quarter and then 12 in the second quarter, so 25 people total whose U visas have been denied. And in the documents that you sent me, the explanation was either four years old, comma, inactive, comma, not pending prosecution. I understand the four-year limitation. I just needed a little bit clarification around the not impending prosecution and the inactive. So, and... Captain Bond can help explain. She works with the DA's office also on our U visa complaints. And they, when they look at these um, packages, they make a decision whether or not a case is going to be prosecutable. So um, I'll let her explain a little Thank bit you. about that. Good evening. Good evening. Mary Ann Bond, Captain with the Durham Police Department. Uh, the, what you're talking about, the 12 and 13 that are inactive, um, they're basically cases with no workable leads. Uh, um, the way our policy is written, case that is over four, four years old needs to be pending prosecution or have um, solvability factors. And so those 12 uh, are cases that there, there are no other leads for the investigators to move on. Um, so I sort of lumped it together. So if they're over four years and there aren't any active leads, then it would go into that c category. Or if they're over four years old and... Um, uh, the prosecution was declined, which occasionally happens, but the majority of them, there's just no workable leads. Okay. Um, and it's for either one of you. How familiar are you with the federal recommendations around UVs? I've seen the law enforcement guidelines. Okay. And so do you think that this policy aligns with what the federal recommendations are? I I'm asking because my understanding was that it wasn't around, it was whether the victim was cooperative or not and whether it met the... Um, type of crime that was a lot, you know, that f fulfilled an obligation. Right. So those are two of the categories. It has to be a qualifying. Yeah, offense. Bond, could you come up uh, closer to the microphone? Thank it, ha you. it has to be a qualifying offense. Of right. The um, I nine eighteen form. Mm -hmm. They have to be um, uh, willing to prosecute and have been cooperative with the investigation. And then they don't have a time frame, frame per se, but there are all th all those other factors are required. So besides the time frame. All the other limitations on it are from the federal, yes, from the federal process. 
Right. So I'll give you another example. We get a lot of uh, cases that come in that are robberies, mm -hmm. and a robbery is not a qualifying offense, right? But part of a subcategory of a robbery would be a kidnapping. So the statutory elements have to be similar from the broader category of the I-918, the U visa uh, qualifying offenses, to what our statute says. So when I get ones for that are, say, robbery, which are a good portion, um, I'll use the qualifying offense as either unlawful restraint or kidnapping because most of the people aren't free to leave in those situations. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I had one last question, and typically how long does it take you to process a U visa certification either through denial or approval? Uh, it depends on the case. So I can get some and go through reading the report, contacting the investigator, and then looking in other databases, um, sometimes in 30 minutes. Uh, I have one that's been on my desk now for two weeks. Um, there's a discrepancy between the victim's name that we have and their date of birth and what the attorney sent. And the last thing I want to do is fill out the form incorrectly and then, then have to go through the whole process and the victim have to pay the attorney more money for um, taking it back before, before the, the hearing. Um, so I'm waiting for a response from the attorney. Thank you. Um, so I just want to say, and I know we've had this conversation before, and I appreciate the work that your department has done around this. And I, I know you're looking at, in the new year, um, you know, at least reviewing the current policy. And I, my hope and expectation is that we will get rid of the time limit that's currently there, which is four years, because that does not align with what the federal program has allowed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Other comments or questions? Council members, Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, hi, Chief. How's it going? Hey, I'm good. How that are you? It was a great report. I just want to Thank state you. for the record, when you were last here for your first quarterly report, I believe the mayor was uh, really playing down the progress that you made and was like, we, we, we can't draw too many conclusions from this first quarter. As I recall, I was effusive in my praise, um, <laughs> and I want to say that again. Um, uh, the work is um, speaks for itself. Um, I think one of the unsung heroes of this, of this type of work is the deep community engagement that you and your department are engaged in. You personally um, are always in the community. Uh, we ran into each other a number of times on a national night out a couple weeks ago. Um, and just the, the level of the, the level of caring that you bring to this job and the people of this city is truly extraordinary, and I want to thank you for that. Um, I want to uh, single out um, an, an, an area that I'm hoping you'll have someone take a look at that I've become aware of over the last couple of weeks. As you may know, um, we recently installed a new bike lanes on South Roxbury Road in South Durham. Mm -hmm. I believe that's District 2 on that side of um, Hope Valley, District okay. 3? District 3, I'm sorry. Um, I should know that's my district, <laughs> uh, the one that I live in. Um, the, the lanes are finally installed, uh, and as you may know, that called for each direction of travel to be reduced, reduced from two vehicle lanes to one. Mm -hmm. And the other lane that's now no longer a travel lane, there is a barrier area that's been painted off a cross-hatched portion and then a bike lane, a fantastic bike lane that I uh, saw some folks riding on earlier this weekend, and it looked fantastic. Thanks for you guys doing all the great work in transportation. Mm -hmm. But one thing I have noticed on the neighborhood listserv, especially on next door, um, is that there are constant reports of drivers using that bike lane as a second lane of travel. Mm. And because it's on the right side, they are passing people on the right, uh, not only endangering any cyclists who may be in the lane, but also people in the actual travel lane who are trying to turn right into their own uh, neighborhoods. Uh, so I just hope you'll um, reach out to the folks in District 3 and have them be vigilant about that particular area uh, because it's, uh, it's a new traffic pattern. Um, and uh, the reason they did this change in the in the configuration of the street was to try to calm down some aggressive drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, my suggestion is that without without some additional enforcement, that might not be successful. So I wanted to put a bug in your ear about that. Duly um, noted. Uh, speaking of aggressive driving, I wanted to heap some praise upon some folks in District 2. Um, uh, over the last couple of months, uh, there's been a driver, uh, they call him Blue Prius Man, um, in Old North Durham and Watts Hill and Dale, who's been um, engaging in some very unsafe uh, behaviors, threatening behaviors with his car. Uh, I want to single out Captain April Brown, Sergeant Tammy Tuck, and Lieutenant Melissa mm -hmm. Bishop, who've worked with folks in those communities uh, to identify this person. Also, we just have to say that Lieutenant Bishop 
uh, in an email to one of the uh, community folks who are working on this issue from the neighborhood side, um, it struck me that her, her description of their investigation of identifying this person was such that she was really concerned about this person's mm -hmm. mental well-being mm -hmm. um, and identified the ability to try to put them in touch with resources as opposed to sending SWAT team in. Uh, that's the kind of uh, leadership that I really appreciate, and I hope you'll uh, let those folks know how much we appreciate that on the council. Um, the last thing I wanted to say, and again, I'll, I will let you go, is that I, I want to second Councilmember Caballero's uh, remarks about the UVISA program. First and foremost, you have done an amazing job at transforming how those applications are reviewed in the police department, and I know Captain Bond is a big part of that. I just want to thank her as well. Um, but I also know that uh, this has got to be taking up more and more of her time <laughs> uh, in doing this work. And so as you move into planning for next year, uh, and as you begin to take a look at the, uh, the resources necessary, not only to accomplish what you've done so far, but to broaden the time scope uh, of the applications that we'll accept, I hope you'll talk to us um, about the resource needs you see in your department uh, and what, whatever we can do to make that option available to more folks in our community, I think we'll be willing to do. So thank you for uh, considering that as the, as the year uh, progresses. Look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you, Chief. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Reese. <clears throat> other, other council members with questions or comments? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Chief. Good evening. And to your command staff that are here. Good to see all of you. Um, first, I'm going to say how much I have uh, appreciated attending the graduation ceremonies uh, from basic law enforcement training. Uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult or challenging um, not to sit there and get the sense that um, these officers aren't being drilled with what we expect and, and the best that we expect um, in, a, in a constitutional democracy and, and upon, from those that we uh, bestow that badge upon. And that those that, that err or stray from that, it isn't because they weren't told and it wasn't drilled in them. And I just want to commend you um, on the job you've been doing, commend, uh, commend this command staff and commend those that train officers. They're very moving uh, ceremonies and humbling ceremonies and, and kind of reset uh, ceremonies for me as well as, as I ponder um, our democracy and ponder what it looks like um, to be accountable to one another um, in, in a civilized uh, constitutional democracy. So I, I want to thank you uh, for that and I enjoy attending, attending the ceremonies. I want to ask you about the community uh, engagement units and the success. And I think that uh, particularly in, in McDougal Terrace, um, I think a lot of the success can be directly attributed uh, to the community engagement unit that's there. Mm -hmm. I think it is a vindication of why you're here. And I think it's a vindication of what a lot of us have been saying in this city for years regarding the power uh, and efficacy of community policing. I want to ask you, how do we replicate it? And I, and I heard you, uh, I saw in the report that you've been having uh, conversations in other communities. Um, I talked to people in Oxford Manor. My church is uh, partnered with Oxford Manor. And we talk to folk in Oxford Manor all the time. Um, from a staffing point of view, is there something we can do? How do we replicate that uh, around the city? And I know it's, you're probably going to say money, uh, staff. <laughs> but, but talk to us about the success of that and, and what can we do uh, to give gas to that engine? Um, I don't think it's money. You know, a lot of the success in that community has a lot to do with people having the heart to be in that community. And um, individuals that know how important it is to have good relationships with the community members that live there and those little kids that live in that community who in another five to 10 years will be adults and have some impression of who police are. And to replicate that throughout the department as part of the cultural competency that we are working on in helping our officers to understand that community policing is who we are every day. It's, it's how we engage in everything that we do taking opportunities to show a different side of humanity. Um, I have to, to add this. I, if you haven't watched it, there is a documentary out called King in the Wilderness. It's a new documentary. And that documentary is about Martin Luther King. And it's probably the most intimate 
um, taping of his life and his encounters with the least of these, but it is a stark reminder to anybody in a leadership position that our work is not about us. It's not about us. And there were people who died so that I could stand here today. People died so that we have council members that don't look like clones. And there is a level of commitment that I have to the community in which I serve every day. So the uniform is what we do, but serving humanity is who we are and who we should be. And if we don't have that part right, then we need to work on changing the mentality of our officers. So that cultural dynamic that we see across the country, it has a lot to do with the speed of the leader. The speed of the leader is the speed of the troop. And I believe that. So that's why my staff here, they know how important community engagement is to me, not just from a policing standpoint, but as a member of the community and that we all should be held accountable to do what we can to impact change. And to have a department, we're in a position to be a model agency. We really are. There are people that are trying to emulate what Durham is doing in spite of what people might think. We're trying to do some good things. It takes time to evolve into that. There have been challenges. There have been distractions. But I remain focused on what I've been called to do. So um, we are going to continue to work on the culture of our department to be servants in the work that we do every day. So I didn't mean to digress. But not at all. That's sort of. Um, you weren't digressing, no, not Chief. At you all. were preaching. It was brilliant. <laughs> Amen. Um, thank you, Chief. And, and you. Final, final question, point question. Everything you've just said has been concretized. Uh, we, we actually have a community <coughs> engagement unit in McDougal Terrace, yes. in Cornwallis. I guess my direct question is, are there any plans to do this at our other housing complexes in, in the city and, and perhaps in other places as well? Absolutely. Those happen to be the communities that seem to have the most challenges. And we know what those challenges have been. There are other communities that I, I feel deserve that same level of service and that same, not just from the Durham Police Department, from other areas in city government that, that can partner with us to try to impact change in you know, how young people stay out of criminal justice systems in the first place. You know, I've said it before, I would love to see somebody put the police department out of business then we will all live happily ever after. But if we don't work and be more proactive in those other communities that you speak of with that same type of engagement that my guys in McDougal Terrace have, then um, we'll, we'll continue to be doing these reports and things. But um, with that said, we plan to continue to grow on that, that model you know, and other housing areas and other apartment complexes, too. Thank you, Chief. Thanks Thank you. to the men and women of your command. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Thank you Council Member. Um, any other Council Members' questions, comments? I have a few questions of my own and comments. Um, I just want to, again, acknowledge um, the uh, very significant drops in violent and property crime. Uh, and uh, I will continue to say, I think it's going to be hard to sustain, but I'm no. thrilled about where we are. And uh, Chief, uh, Council Member Reese is right. I was, a, I didn't think we could sustain it into the second quarter, and good job. Thank you. I'm wrong on occasion, Chief. We're going to try to put a pin in it. I don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fantastic. I mean, the, the, um, the robbery and aggravated assault figures especially are great. Uh, the, clearly, the robbery task force is making a huge difference. And not You can tell that not just in the drop in crime, but also in the clearance rates. Yes. Uh, which I think are something Absolutely. like twice the national average yes. for robberies. And uh, so congratulations, that, congratulations. And to be above the FBI average in clearance rates in every single category is fantastic. 
Uh, I noticed that the drug violations are about 50% below 2016. Um, again, I think, I know that this is uh, in large part due to our pre-arrest diversion to the misdemeanor diversion program. I want to, again, uh, encourage the continued uh, use and support of that program and appreciate you, command staff, and the officers in the department for uh, making use of the misdemeanor diversion program, which I think has been really effective in um, in keeping uh, people, first-time offenders, uh, potential offenders, uh, out of the criminal justice system so that they uh, don't uh, start a start their life with a record that uh, can follow them forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think what we're doing with the misdemeanor diversion program in terms of the supports that are offered there are great. I've been really pleased with a lot of times we don't have the ability to follow up in terms of the services and so forth needed, but I think in this program we really have, and uh, I commend the other agencies that are working with you for that. The police recruits, I noted that, uh, one of the things I noted that uh, we have had some uh, in the past where we have seen a lot of recruits in the, in the charts that you give us who have failed the test, especially the written test, but written or physical. I noticed how few of these recruits had failed that test, and. I'm not sure why that is, maybe selection of the potential recruits, but uh, do you have any comments on that? Well, you know, I don't know if it's the selection or if it's the effort of the staff to try to make sure that our, our, our young people that are going through um, this training, they understand how arduous it is and uh, to work with them in their study habits and being very intentional, especially on some of the blocks that are very complicated. There are a couple of blocks that are very complicated and quite frankly, our young people don't uh, do, do very well. Um, I now sit on the um, North Carolina Commission for Training and Standards and in my first meeting, one of the conversations was that test and the actual um, re-evaluating the test. So um, that is something that it is in the process because of that very reason, the failure rate. So. Well, I was glad to see ours that, had, that our failure rate had really gone down. And yes. Proven. That was great. Yes. Um, the U visa figures, um, I again uh, want to say I really appreciate the change in policy that you initiated at the beginning of this year. I think it's making positive difference in a lot of lives. And I think that it's making positive difference in, a, in, in the life of our community as well. And I uh, want to thank Captain Bond uh, for her work on that. And it's great to see those numbers go up. Uh, I do, uh, I'm very hopeful that uh, you'll be reevaluating at the beginning of the year and that you will be extending the uh, time past the four years. Uh, it, it, that may uh, induce uh, a small surge of people who are coming in after that, but I think it after that, we would be back into kind of our regular order of application. So I hope you'll give that strong consideration. Absolutely. Um, so many of the, uh, I, 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 the, the report, uh, which I know that we publish on our website, has so many individual stories of officers who uh, have done so many uh, uh, terrific things, either as community members, uh, some of the some of the uh, officers that you cited, but also just the simply the great police work that some of these folks have done, the robbery task force, uh, the you mentioned Officer Gardino for the wheelchair donation, but also he, he was extremely effective during the same period as an investigator. Uh, the officers who performed CPR, mouth to mouth res resuscitation to save lives, uh, and the officers doing a great job in reducing violent crime. So. To me, um, well, let me just mention one thing that I think is uh, on, on, there's a slide with part one violent crimes that I just want to ask you all to look at. It looks to me like burglary, it says burglaries are down less than 1%. I think burglaries are actually down, when I did the numbers, about 4.5%. Um, but uh, anyway, take a look at that for the future. Uh, no need to check on that now, but it is something that I, that I, did, that I did see, and I, I think my math is right. Um, we are, in a way, uh, I think that when you just look at the numbers, I think that we are in a place in policing in Durham that we haven't been in a long time. 
And I, this is a tribute to you all who lead the department and the officers. And that is this place, which is violent crime is down tremendously. Property crime is down significantly. And at the same time, we are greatly reducing the criminalization of small acts, especially by young people. Uh, through the misdemeanor diversion program and, our, and also through our written consent to search policy. I think we are doing what we hoped we would do, which is reduce the criminalization of small acts and devote our resources to the reduction of violent crime. And I think what that means we're doing, that we're reducing violent crime at the same time as we are building trust in the community. And that is a sweet spot. Uh, and uh, all uh, tributes to you, the department, uh, and all the other community partners that are helping make this happen. I'm, I do have one uh, question that, uh, of concern that I wanted you to address. And uh, we have, we, during, between, uh, during this last quarter, we had an officer-involved shooting uh, in the last couple of weeks. And I think whenever that happens, we all have to ask ourselves very, very deep questions. I know this, the SBI is investigating and, the, and, the, and your standards uh, division uh, yes. is investigating as well. And so I know there are ongoing investigations. I'll just express my concern and, um, and then um, just would uh, love to hear any comments you have. I have, in the past, I have thought that there were uh, two times uh, over the past few years when I have felt that the department uh, could have improved what we have done regarding people who were mentally ill uh, and had a gun or what was thought to be a gun uh, and ended up in both times in an officer-involved shooting uh, and the death of those two people. One of them was the young man in uh, CCB Plaza several years ago. Uh, the other was, uh, and I believe his name was Derek Brooks, the other was uh, Levante Biggs. In both of those situations, I have been concerned that mentally ill people who were in an unstable situation, that we, uh, I, I was concerned that we did not use the requisite patience, uh, that we, um, we needed to be spending more time if necessary waiting out people. Uh, and I have been, and I have raised these concerns um, both of these chiefs were uh, prior to your arrival, but I know that the other chiefs here have heard me raise those concerns. I, I believe that this situation was significantly different than that, than that uh, in the sense that, um, at least from my understanding uh, the, of the situation, there was a, um, this was not a situation where someone was known to be kind of holed up somewhere uh, with a gun and we, you know, could have surrounded and waited. Um, but this was a mentally ill person, a person who clearly was, uh, you know, in many ways, at least from reports during the day, a dangerous person uh, had been doing dangerous, very, very dangerous things. Mm -hmm. um, but was also a mentally ill person, and I'm not asking you to, to say what, you know, exactly you think would have happened or could have happened because I know there's an investigation. But I just wondered if you could offer some perspective on how the department ought to be thinking about approaching people who are mentally ill, uh, you know, who have a gun, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, kind of how you would differenti differentiate certain situations, that kind of thing. So that was a long question and comment, uh, but if you had some comments, I'd appreciate it. Well, my response to that, and of course it is an ongoing investigation, as you said, Mayor Shul, is that we have to always look at the training that we provide for our officers. And we want our officers to exercise, utilize the training based on the situation at hand. None of these situations have mirrored the others, especially the ones that I have been involved in, and most of them haven't even come close. Um, I can say that I think this is one of those situations that once the SBI has concluded the investigation, 
that we will continue to look and evaluate our training. Our officers uh, are trained in crisis intervention. Uh, they utilize crisis intervention on a regular basis and have, have proven that. And I do believe they utilize that on that night as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine, thank you. Um, and I appreciate your continued uh, continued attention to that. I think we all know the role that mental illness plays in some of these crisis situations. So I really appreciate the training. I really appreciate the fact that I know officers, including on this night, are in very dangerous situations and have to react quickly. Absolutely. Uh, I'm very cognizant of that and uh, I'm not critical, uh, but uh, would appreciate all the attention you can give to this because I have, th I have believed in the past that there have been situations where waiting longer uh, could have saved a life. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not contending that's true in this case, but I hope you'll give attention to it. All right, other council members? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Council Member Freeman. Uh, thank you. Um, I also uh, attended my first graduation. I wanna say that it was um, interesting. I wanna echo uh, Middleton's comments around the experience of recognizing how much is poured into each cadet, or I'm not even sure if that's the right word, Recruit, cadet, Recruit. you're absolutely right, that's fine. Um, but I was really uh, touched by how much of a commitment each of the trainers made to each of those um, moving from trainee to service. Yes. I, um, I also wanted to make sure that I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just in awe. This, the police and policing side of things is not my wheelhouse, so I'm new to that area, and I'm learning a lot. I, I also wanted to, to say that I really appreciate uh, the expansion that I'm seeing with the Police Athletic League mm -hmm. and recognizing on a much more positive note, <laughs> I don't wanna leave on a negative one, that there, there's a lot of officers who spend a lot of volunteer time um, serving in these, serving as coaches, and I really want to figure out if there's a way to support them as, as best as possible with uh, more city services. Well, we appreciate that. Um, one thing about the Police Athletic League, and this is a not just for the Police Athletic League here in this city, but the success of Police Athletic Leagues is primarily because a lot of the young people that our officers deal with on a day-to-day -day -day basis, some of them are pretty tough kids. And they're the kind of kids that get kicked out of parks and recreation and some of the other facilities that, you know, they might want to go to. And our officers give them a, a little bit of tough love sometimes. They have kids and they help these kids get by some very difficult places in their lives, especially at the age of 10, 11, 12, and 13. After that, it's a little bit too late. So um, I appreciate that support. I don't have an opportunity to talk about the sacrifice sometimes that they do make on their own personal time and the kind of contributions they, they deposit in some of these young people's lives. But um, coming from council, that is um, a very positive thing to share for them, and I'll let them know that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Freeman. Chief, thank you. Thank you. We've held you a long time tonight, and right. uh, but we appreciate your report. To your staff, thank you very much. We're very appreciative of the work you do, and please pass that on to the department. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chief. All right. We'll now move on to the general business agenda, public hearings, and the first agenda item is item 13, a zoning map change for 1900 Hillendale Road 2. And uh, I will ask uh, if we can uh, have the report from staff. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins with the planning department. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to note that all the planning items this evening have been noticed and advertised in accordance with both local and state laws and affidavits are on file with the planning department noting such. Um, so for this item, this is a request received from Pamela Porter for three parcels of land generally located at 1900 Hill and Dell Road comprising approximately 1.3 acres. The subject site is present, presently zoned residential suburban eight. The applicant is requesting a zoning designation of residential urban multifamily with a development plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. If the development of plan is approved, this will permit a maximum of 15 townhouse units at this site. Some key commitments on the development plan, the aforementioned 15 unit maximum, 
some additional buffering along the eastern property line of the subject site, the site access points, as well as design commitments. The Durham Planning Commission, at their June 12, 2018 hearing, recommended approval by a vote of 12 to 0. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions would be required to approve this item. The first would be to adopt a zoning, or excuse me, the first would be to adopt a consistency statement, and the second would be for the zoning ordinance. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiggins. You. You've heard the report from staff, and I'll now uh, declare this public hearing open. And first, I'll ask if there are any questions for Mr. Wiggins by members of the council. Just one mm -hmm. specifically, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Uh, so I noticed that this one, this zoning map change has a development plan. Is that just because, or is there some sp particular reason why it was included? It was the applicant's choice. This is the, the RUM district is not a district which requires a development plan. So I really want to thank the developer um, for using their right. To I met, yeah, I imagine he's here. So thank you. Can thank Appreciate it. You're getting a, a thumbs up from the developer back there, Councilman. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, other questions at this point for the um, for for staff. All righty. Uh, I am, do not see any speakers for this. Are there any, does any, is there anyone that would like to speak on item 13? Is there anyone who would like to speak on item 13? Any members of the public who are here, this is a public hearing, who would like to speak on item 13? All right. Uh, if not, uh, council members, um, any other questions or comments? I have one. Any other? Okay. Uh, go ahead, council member Caballero. Um, I'm just looking at the the BPAC comments and just wondering if there was any updates. On that. Yeah, that was my question as well. The off-site sidewalk from the property to Dartmouth, and sure. if the developers here, maybe you could comment on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is the, the the come on up, and I'll uh, you want to you go ahead and ask the question if you'd like. And I'm just re I'm just noting that the response from the applicant, which is you, sir, uh, was to. Um, not provide the suggested pedestrian access, access on the development plan. And I'm just curious as to why. Sure. Um, simple answer is. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm sorry. My name is Jim Anthony, and I am the developer of this lot. And fortunately, we've got some of our neighbors here that we've worked with over months to get this uh, brought to your table today. Um, we had discussed uh, the opportunities of installing a sidewalk along the street, which we intend to do along our frontage on the street. Did not want to carry it beyond that frontage. We have not had any sort of conversations with the neighbors whether they want a sidewalk crossing their lot or not. We didn't feel like that was our place to force them to accept a sidewalk. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, this was raised in a couple of the items tonight and is often raised about the offsite sidewalks, uh, small segments that could help us complete our sidewalk network. And I understand Mr. Anthony's point, you know, that these are other neighbors and that they have their own choices about that. But it is also, um, you know, it is something that I, I, and one of the planning commission members several times recently, Mr. Al Turk, has mentioned in his comments the need to reevaluate this and, and how we view it. Um, so I think that's a good idea. I also know that there are people who have property rights and uh, it's, it makes it for a complicated situation. But thank you for raising that. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Very quick question. What are, what are the anticipated price points of the uh, units you're seeking to develop? That has not been finally determined. But I am guessing that somewhere in the two hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollar price range. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. You have heard uh, the the answers to the questions. And um, have any more comments or questions? Anyone on the public wish to speak on this item? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed.
the matter is back before the council. Any, any, uh, do I hear a motion to adopt the consistency statement? So moved. Second. Moved and second to adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you. And the second motion is to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO by taking property out of the commercial neighborhood with a development plan, zoning district, and establishing the same as commercial neighborhood with a development so moved. plan. Moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance to amend the UDO. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Ordinance passes 7-0. Thank you very much. I had met with some neighbors uh, concerning this previously, and I want to say that I think this is a much improved uh, proposal and want to appreciate you all, and I want to appreciate the developer for working with the neighborhood. Thank you. We'll now move to item 14, zoning map change 5246 North Roxburgh Road. Mr. Mayor, uh, Jacob Wiggins of the Planning Department. I believe the previous motion that was read was for the next case and not this particular case. I was just trying to trick you. Thank you. Jacob. <laughs> it almost worked. Doggone, you were paying attention. Okay, that was, I'm sorry, that was motion two. We'll do it again. To adopt an ordinance amending the UDA by taking prior by the residential suburban RS8 zoning district and establishing the same as residential urban multifamily development plan, RUMD. I'll move that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? And my apologies. Close the vote. The motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiggins, for correcting me. And now we'll move to zoning map change 5246 North Roxborough Road. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins, again, with the planning department. This is a zoning map change request for property located at 5246 North Roxborough Street, totaling approximately 1.9 acres. The subject site is presently zoned commercial neighborhood with a development plan, and the applicant is also requesting commercial neighborhood with a development plan. The development plan governing the site was approved in 1987 and restricted the use of the site to a family care home. The current development plan in front of you would permit any uses allowed in the CN district, save for those that do not trigger the need for a traffic impact analysis. Some key commitments on the development plan associated with this request would be a maximum of 20,000 square feet of commercial floor area, a potential transit stop along North Roxborough Street, a side access point, as well as design commitments. At their June 12th, 2018 hearing, the Planning Commission recommended approval by a vote of 11 to 0, and staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Two motions are required, one for the consistency statement and the second for the zoning ordinance. And I'll be happy to answer any questions the council may have at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiggins. You have heard the report from staff and I'm now gonna declare this public hearing open. Uh, we have one member of the public who signed up to speak on this, Mr. Jim Clark. Uh, Mr. Clark, uh, you have three minutes. Good evening, uh, my name is Jim Clark, as you said. I work for Patch Design Group, a local engineering firm in Raleigh, and I'm speaking on behalf of this application representing the ownership as well as the prof professional engineer that prepared the development plan, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all might have or anybody in the audience might have uh, from an engineering standpoint or questions about the application itself. Thank you, Mr. Thank Clark. You. Are there other members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Are there any members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Council members, do you have questions for the applicant or for staff? If not, I'm going to just state just a statement to say that I appreciate once again the included development plan. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and the matter is back before the council. There are two motions that are required. The first is to adopt a consistency statement. The second is to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Uh, is there a motion to adopt a consistency statement? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The consistency statement passes 7-0. Thank you. 
Do I hear a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Ordinance passes 7-0. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. We will now move to item 15, consolidated dated items, Hillsborough at Coal Mill Road. Good evening. I'm Jamie Sunyak with the Planning Department. Requests for a zoning map change has been received from Dan Jewell for nine parcels totaling approximately 5.074 acres located at 30... 3578 Hillsborough Road. The subject tracks are currently zoned industrial and industrial light. The applicant is requesting a zoning designation of 1.563 acres of commercial general with a development plan to expand the existing convenience store with a gas station and add a car wash. And 4.141 acres of industrial light with a development plan to build a hotel up to 90 feet tall. The applicant also requests to change a portion of the future land use map designation from commercial to industrial to have the industrial light designation coincide and conform to the future land use map. In addition, there is a portion of Christian Avenue shown on the development plan which is proposed to be closed. Key commitments on the development plan associated with this request. Proffered commitments of the uses stated above and the street closure as well as cross access easements between the two properties and connecting Christian Avenue, Avenue to Coal Mill Road. The Durham Planning Commission at their June 12, 2018 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of 12 to zero. Staff determines that these, that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to amend the future land use map the second is to adopt a consistency statement, and the third is for the zoning ordinance. I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Sunyak. You've heard the report from staff. I'm going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any, any questions or comments, uh, questions for staff by members of the council. Any questions for staff at this point by members of the council? All right, if not, we have one speaker on this item signed up, Mr. Dan Jewell. Uh, Mr. Jewell, welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I am Dan Jewell with Culture Jewell Thames. i um, here at the request of uh, Holmes Oil, Mr. Edward Holmes, who's with me here this evening to uh, make this zoning request to you. Uh, this site was occupied by Miller Truck Body for many, many years. Those of you who are familiar with the site know it's covered with big metal and concrete block buildings, uh, parking lots that are starting to break up and barbed wire fences around the outside. There's also an old uh, convenience gas station at the corner. Our proposal calls for a hotel of up to 220 rooms, up to 90 feet in height, as well as a new convenience store with Wash Bay. We think this will be transformative for this corner, provide more property tax base, uh, bring people to this neighborhood who will spend more money in com the community, and in general be a huge appearance upgrade to the neighborhood. We will be providing stormwater and runoff management for the entire site where none exists today. As the staff report says, we are actually reducing the number of cars from what could be done under the current zoning on the property, and of course, there are no school impacts associated with this. This proposal will also create an internal connection from Wortham and Christian out to Coal Mill Road so that folks won't have to negotiate that crazy dangerous intersection at Coal Mill and Hillsboro that I think you're familiar with. And most importantly, 75 to 80 jobs will be created here where no jobs exist today. In other words, we think that by every measure, this proposal will have a positive impact on the neighborhood and a positive impact in Durham. And at the neighborhood meeting we held last fall, uh, there were in fact no detractors, but there were several folks who wanted to know how quickly we could get started. Well, we can get started soon and hope that you will agree with the Planning Commission and their unanimous approval, recommendation for approval and the staff, and allow us to move on to the next step. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jewell. Are there other members of the public who are here tonight who would wish to speak on this item? Is there any other member of the public here tonight who wish to speak on this public hearing item? All right. If not, I'm going to ask uh, council members if you have questions or comments for staff or for the applicant. 
Council members? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jewell, I had a question for you. You mentioned, uh, first of all, I think this is a great location for a hotel because it is proximate to one of my favorite restaurants uh, in Durham Cookout, <laughs> right across that um, busy intersection. What was the word used? Not busy, it was crazy. Crazy, thank you, that's right. Uh, and in light of that, I wonder if you would speak just briefly uh, to your to the applicant's position uh, on the BPAC comment concerning uh, pedestrian access uh, in that area. That yes, sir. Yes, sir. Those, those comments often come up, uh, as you know, at many meetings. Uh, in this case, though, we we countered back to uh, the staff person in charge of BPAC that there are two uh, not just compelling but legal reasons why those improvements can't be made. First, at Coal Mill and Hillsboro. If you have ever gone through that intersection westbound, you don't stop if you're turning on the Coal Mill Road. DOT has designed a very wide, gracious through lane, which I tested the other day, and I could drive through it at 30 miles an hour and make that turn on the Coal Mill Road without slowing down. So I think it would be extremely dangerous to just add a crosswalk and a pedestrian refuge in there. I think um, if it's the, the will of the city to make that intersection pedestrian friendly, it's going to take some major redesign of that intersection to make it work. Now secondly, in terms of the Christian Avenue frontage uh, and the, the, the front of the Taco Bell Kentucky Fried Chicken that's in the corner there owned by Lewin Properties. So there is uh, insufficient right of way on both sides uh, without moving the existing power poles to put a sidewalk in. Uh, my client, Mr. Holmes, actually happens to know the owner of that property, and he approached them. He said, would you be willing to either put the sidewalk on your property or allow the power poles to be moved onto your property because they're to make room for a sidewalk? Uh, and they declined that. I will say in terms of the, I also always appreciate Mr. Uh, Al Turk's comments, but in terms of uh, consistency and comprehensive plan, I, I noticed that we have four relatively new fast food restaurants now along that stretch of Hillsboro. You've got Zaxby's, the Krispy Kreme, which we did, the most important project ever in Durham, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> uh, the Bojangles, and the uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Taco I Bell. certainly don't think that Krispy Only, Kreme was more important than the Bojangles. Well, I this is true. Right this, is, this is debatable. There you go. But <laughs> if you notice, <laughs> only Good one help. of those properties was required to put a sidewalk along the front, the Krispy Kreme. The rest of them do not. So it might be time for a kind of a holistic look at, at pedestrian circulation through there. Maybe the uh, hotel will provide a shuttle over to the cookout. So. There you go. So I'll talk to him about that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You Popeye. never know what's going to come up at these meetings, do you? Popeye said the same thing about being the most important <laughs> project in Durham, by the way. <laughs> cookout. <laughs> I can see we're going to have some contention here about our favorite fast food. We'll discuss that later. We'll discuss that in closed session. Absolutely. <laughs> Council members, are there any more questions or comments for the applicant or for staff? Uh, any more? Okay. I, I'll just comment that I think this is a, a great place for this project and will be a huge improvement and I uh, look forward to it. Um, if not, uh, and if there are no more comments, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and uh, the, the uh, matter is back before the Council. Uh, the, it'll take three motions to do this. Uh, the first will be to adopt the resolution amending the future land use map. Do I hear such a motion? Move to adopt. Move. Second. It's moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? I really hate to do that. Close the vote. The resolution passes 7-0. Thank you. Now we need a motion to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. <clears throat> motion passes 7-0. Thank you. And now we need a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Ordinance passes 7-0. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. We have one more item on our agenda tonight, which is item 18, which was on the consent agenda and has been pulled, uh, and is the contract with the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau for implementation of the city's 150th anniversary celebration in 2019. Um, and I'm going to uh, ask uh, Councilmember Freeman, I believe, pull the item.
And if you wanted to make some comments and or ask any questions, and uh, we'll proceed in that way. Sure. I I really appreciate the the work that's gone into presenting and putting all this together for the Durham 150. And uh, the questions I posed to our city attorney around making sure that we included um, specifically some First Nations folks and uh, people of color language in the document is not there. And so I just wanted to make sure that, uh, that it was noted why. And, and then also noting that there were jobs outlined, but there was no mention of the livable wage, uh, which I also asked about. Um, I'll, I'll take those in, um, in the order that you presented them. Um, in the memo, I did uh, incorporate that language um, that you had raised uh, in, and it's in red there. Uh, the challenge with putting it actually in the interlocal is that the interlocal is with the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, they're not actually going to be uh, the entity that's going to be making those determinations. In fact, they're, they're essentially a pass-through uh, as it relates to receiving money uh, to um, temporarily hire uh, the, these individuals. Uh, it's the um, convening committee uh, that, that actually um, uh, hires the individuals and, and would be the entity that, that assures the, the equity um, that you had, had raised. The um, problem here is that the convening committee isn't a legal entity. Um, it's sort of an oversight board over this entire um, uh, project. So uh, what I try to do, uh, yeah, next best uh, thing, was to put it in the memo um, as a charge to the convening committee, and that was based on, on, on my understanding of uh, the, the process and in consultation uh, both with Shelley Green and uh, of the Convention and Visitors Bureau and Beverly Thompson. Um, I'm not sure if the mayor has any comments about that. Um, but that seemed to be the best place to put that and to highlight that that was the entity that, that would be overseeing those equitable issues. And then just a question regarding the convening committee. Is that going to be designated by the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau? Or is it determined by city council? I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask uh, Shelley Green if she wants to come and talk about the, uh, the convening committee. Thank you, Council Mayor. Um, the convening committee was. Shelley, can you introduce yourself? Yes, your sorry. I'm Shelley Green, and I'm president and CEO of the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau. And the convening committee was put in place by Mayor Shule. So he asked myself and Patrick Mucklow, who is the executive director of the um, Museum of Durham History, to chair that committee. And then Eddie Davis serves on the committee, Beverly Thompson serves on the committee. Susan Amy, uh, our chief marketing officer at DCVB, uh, serves on the committee. We just added uh, Pilar uh, Goldberg. <laughs> I always mess with the, the Goldberg. Right, thank you. Uh, and I'm forgetting somebody else. I think, I think um, Emily Aggie, is she on the committee? Emily Aggie. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the conven convening committee. Um, the only other people that right now we're planning to add to that are the committee chairs of all the subcommittees. So we have a fundraising committee, we have a opening ceremonies committee, a closing ceremonies committee, um, we have a finance committee that oversees the internal controls and how the money comes in and out and those kinds of things. So those people, as we uh, gear up with those committees, they will also be added to the convening committee. Thank you. And then just the one additional question around, uh, I think I lost my thought on it. On the livable wage? Well, I mean, I feel sufficient, and there's sufficient folks in, that understand the living wage ordinance that we put in place or on the convening committee. Yes, and, and some of the positions are hourly positions, and I can tell you that they would have a living wage. Um, and then some of them are contract positions where if you're the um, event planner for the opening ceremonies, it's it's not an hourly position. It's a position by the job. And then uh, that, uh, I'm not sure if I brought this question up in work session or not around making sure we coordinate, but I think I did coordinate well with the Parks and Rec to make sure that the there's enough overlap and the communications and the logos and everything else around marketing to make sure that it's incorporated into a lot of what we do already. 
And so I'm not sure who, I'm not sure who I should be. Maybe we should address that uh, to you, Shelley, first. I'm going to make sure I understand. You want the Durham 150 logo incorporated into what the city and Parks and Rec does? Uh, so specifically, the Parks and Rec is, is currently the entity that usually plans mm -hmm. special events for the city. And recognizing that, you know, the event, events like the Latino Festival this past, was it the past weekend before, where it's the full, or Durham 150, making sure that that's incorporated into that means having a conversation with them on a regular basis. Yes, and that logo will be available to anyone who is hosting a Durham 150th themed event. Um, we, we just haven't gotten to the point where we've put all of the standards in place for how you use the logo. And that's what I'm trying to incorporate, like trying to make sure that you incorporate people who have been doing this. Mm -hmm into the process so that they're not just being told what the logo is and the standards and everything else. So Got it. Incorporate. Got it. Okay. okay, thank you for those questions and comments. And I think that um, those are very important uh, issues that Councilmember Freeman's been raising uh, in terms of uh, the wages and the and the uh, the equity and diversity that we want to see represented. I know you all are highly cognizant of that, but I appreciate her raising those questions. Absolutely. All right. Are there any other questions or comments, Councilmember Middleton? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to say I'd like to echo uh, your comments about Councilor Freeman's uh, comments as well. I, I just want to go on record saying that I'm, if if we this list in the contract should not be viewed as exhaustive, and if we think of anything else after the contract is signed, uh, I at least certainly reserve the right to make some noise about it. So. Don't view this contract as if we don't put it in there, we can't bring it up afterwards. I would just Thank like to make sure, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Mr. Mayor, if I could just be sure to let me know when the convening group meets. If I do have these concerns, I can bring them up. Is okay, well, I'm sure that, uh, Shelley, you can make that, make our uh, council members aware. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let me just uh, say one quick word about this, just to remind people of the structure that we have. So. Uh, this is the, the group that is getting all this together is private people doing it on their own time. We are going to be financing through this part of their work, but they're also going to be raising, hopefully, quite a bit more money to make this work. And the whole principle here is that we are not trying to, uh, that this is, this is not a centralized 150 celebration. We want to let a thousand flowers blossom, if you don't mind me quoting Chairman Mao. Um, and um, I think that uh, that's the kind of, that is the kind of, um, that's, that's the kind of celebration that we want here in Durham, that it's going to be very grassroots, that for the, for Burl City 150, we want 150 organizations or more to be celebrating in their own way. Schools, uh, churches, civic groups. Uh, we just was uh, with the, uh, some folks at DPAC and urged them to be participating, and I know they got right in touch with you, Shelley. So let's urge everybody we can to participate in this. Uh, and we know that participation will be very different for different groups. Some of them will want to have a big party, and some of them will be wanting to do very serious things about important issues in Durham's uh, last 150 and, and the next 150. So I'm excited about it. Uh, and I uh, appreciate you, Shelley, for stepping up to the leadership, uh, Eddie Davis, Patrick uh, Beverly, and others who, uh, who, have, who have stepped up to this. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'm now going to accept a motion just on this One item. more thing, Mr. Mayor. I just want to let folks know in the community that I am open to all 150 events. Please send me an invitation. <laughs> Exactly. Good uh, Good point. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be hearing about it. Let me just also say, the first email newsletter has now come out. Uh, if you are interested in Bull City 150 and you want to know what all those events are, you can sign up for the newsletter. In fact, I think you've probably got all council members on the list at this point. Right. Yeah. So, uh, council members, you should be getting, uh, uh, as, these, as, this, as these events come up, They'll be added to the calendar, and we should be hearing about all of them. Uh, to remind everybody, the official kickoff will be with the holiday parade, uh, and we'll take it from there. Okay, I'll, I'll accept a motion now on this item. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we pass item 18. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? <clears throat> Close the vote. 
Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. And no more items to come before this council. I'm going to declare this meeting closed, this meeting adjourned at 9-13. Thank you, council members. Thank you, Madam Deputy City Manager.